Good morning, church. It is a privilege to be back in the book of Galatians again. I hope you feel the same. Uh, We've been in there for months now, and I want to encourage you to turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible with you and you want to use the Pew Bible in front of you, it's on page 974. It's actually the same scripture that we already heard read earlier in the service. And if you don't have a Bible at all, here or at home or anywhere, we'd love to give you one as our gift to you. So if you would stop by our welcome desk after the service and, and just ask for a Bible, we would be happy to, to give you one. So that's Galatians chapter 5. And for months now, the book of Galatians has told us again and again how it is that we can be 100% certain that we will be forgiven of every single one of our sins And in the last day, when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead, you will not be declared guilty and condemned, but you would be righteous and thereby welcomed into eternal life. Now, that's a long sentence summary of what we've been talking about, but nonetheless, it is to see that we are talking about amazing things and incredibly significant things at that. And through the first four chapters of Galatians, we've been discovering exactly what it is that actually gets us this eternal security, but also what it is not. And so as we've looked and seen time and time again, is how the Bible tells us that salvation is received through Jesus plus nothing. Now, I know that it's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus, or I'm trusting in Jesus, But it's another thing to actually understand what it is that Jesus has done for you and how it is that that saves you. And so if we get this wrong, while thinking we're right, in the end, this is going to have eternally devastating consequences for you. And so I want to clarify again what we mean when we say Jesus plus nothing. The Bible goes to great lengths to teach us that our works Everything that we do in our lives and with our lives is corrupted by the sin within every single one of us. And so, because of that, nothing that we do can actually get us saved. Nothing that we do contributes to saving us. And so everything that we might have ever hoped for, perhaps even coming to church or being a respectable person, we think that these things are helpful to save us. Or maybe it's eating healthy and exercising. Maybe it's fighting for human rights in some way, or even picking up after our dog when no one is looking. I think all of these ways, big and small, we feel like we're better people, that we're good people, and therefore God should save us because of the things that we do. But none of these things actually increase our chances of God accepting us. And it's bad news to hear that, but it's true. And all of these things, whatever it might be in your mind right now, Paul calls these things works of the law. And in chapter 3, we saw how he explicitly tells us that everyone who relies on works of the law are under a curse because you can't be saved by works. The reason why you can't be saved this way is because even if we do the things that God wants us to do, it doesn't hide the things or remove the things that we have done that God doesn't want us to do. So, so we, can't least, we can't simply just think that more good deeds will erase our bad ones. And so the question we have to ask is, what does save us? If our works don't save us, what does save us? What does actually get us forgiven? What does make us acceptable to God? And the answer to that question is we, what we've been saying is that it's Jesus plus nothing. Because Jesus lived a sinless life to earn the righteousness that you couldn't earn on your own. And Jesus died a sinner's death to earn the forgiveness that you couldn't earn on your own. And so we don't, think, we don't do things now to convince Jesus to give this to us. He actually offers this to us that if we have faith, if we will just receive this gift that he's freely offering to anyone who would accept it, That is how we're saved. Jesus is enough. And therefore, Jesus, not you and not me and not anyone else or anything else, Jesus plus nothing is the way to be saved. So if you're only joining us for the first time this morning, 
I, you now know what it is that we mean as a church here when we say Jesus plus nothing. It's a short way of referring to a summary statement of our core belief. What do we think the Bible is teaching us about salvation? And we find this also in chapter 2, uh, verse 16 in Galatians. We saw that it says that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we've abandoned everything that we think would save us other than that. We, we give up all our good efforts, all our hard work, all our best deeds, and we cling to Christ and, it, and believe that His work is enough to save us. His work is why He took on flesh to come and accomplish for you and for me this salvation that we so desperately need. And so to be completely forgiven, 100% of every sin, and to be declared righteous by God in the end is, is secured through what Jesus has done and not what we have done. So we don't work for it. We receive Jesus' work for us. And we don't work for it. We receive this by the grace of God. And we don't work for it. We receive this by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing means that Jesus is a sufficient Savior. Nothing beyond Him and nothing beyond His work is necessary for me or you to be at peace with God. And it's our mission here at Strathmore Alliance to know this and to live this and to proclaim this. So that's what we've seen. Salvation through Jesus plus nothing is what we've seen through the first four chapters of Galatians. And it leads us into chapter 5 as we look at it today. With all that Paul has said so far, the believers in Galatia who he's writing to are now equipped with a gospel understanding of how it is that they're saved and so the things that they're dealing with in those congregations, this is now going to help them understand what they're supposed to do with that. And I think in the same way, even though there were issues back then that we might not relate to, there are issues today that we need to understand how it is that we need to uh, deal with these things. Before faith in Christ, we were enslaved. And the slavery Paul talks about is being enslaved to working and working and working to try to save ourselves. And it would never be done. And so Jesus, or Jesus has set us free, Paul says. And that's where we end up starting in chapter 5, verse 1. Look at this verse. For freedom, Christ has set us free. And so I just want to stop there and tell you something. Brothers and sisters, you are free. You are free from having to earn your own salvation. Do you feel this freedom in Christ? You're free from the curse of failing over and over and over again to meet God's standards. You're free from the, the past shame and sin and guilt that has plagued you for, for years. You're, you're free from the reservations that were made in hell because of your transgressions and because of your sins. Church, you are free. And Paul emphasizes this the best way that he can, and it's almost a little bit awkward in verse 1. He just spells it out for us. He says, Christ has set us free, not for slavery, but for freedom. Now, it's a little bit awkward to say that, right? Because if someone is set free, they're free, aren't they? But he says, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Now, why would he say it that way? Well, it's because these, these believers were set free, and now they were in the danger of, being, of going back into slavery. And he says, that's not what you're free for. You're free for freedom. And so the command that we're given today, the warning that we're given today, and the reminder that we hear is that we're free, but you need to stay free. Stay free. Because believers are not exempt from the dangerous temptations of being set free. We are saved sinners, and we are not yet fully sanctified. And we deal with sin still. So what are the dangers that Paul wants to talk about? That's what chapter 5 was written for. We see two things, and I'm going to deal with the first one today. In verse 1, it says, you're free. But then it says, stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So the first danger that we're going to talk about today is that we can lose our freedom if we were to go back into that slavery. But jump down to verse 13. There's a second thing that Paul wants to warn us about. He tells us that we're free, same thing, and then he says, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. 
And so the second danger is that we would actually abuse our freedom. We can lose it, and we can abuse it. And that's what we'll, the second one is what we'll look at next week. So for today, our text commands Christians in verse 1 to stand firm, and specifically in your freedom. Stand firm. It says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. In other words, he's saying to you, you're free, now stay free. And so off the top, we need to realize that following Christ isn't easy. We're not just set free and everything's perfect and it's just, we just wait till eternal life comes. That's not how it goes. There is a battle going on here and we need to stand firm. And so when we, when we see in Galatians how we've been set free, we now know how it is that we must stay free. And Paul says, stand free, or stand firm in your freedom. Don't lose your freedom. And I wonder today how many of us are actively standing firm. How many of us are defending ourselves from going back into this slavery? See, Galatians, uh, Paul couldn't say this in chapter 1. He's built on his argument all the way up till now, and he says, you've been set free, but now there's dangers as well. You need to stand firm and stay free and guard yourself against going back into that slavery. Remember, this warning is for believers. Paul's writing to the churches, to people who claim to be Christians. And so when the Christians are hearing this, we see that this is a difficulty. This is a battle. This is a temptation that we must all be aware of and all be actively standing against. Because we don't simply just get saved and, and walk away from, from sin and never to deal with it again. See, how many of us in this room are still struggling with sin even though we've been set free from it? All of us. This battle continues until Christ returns. And so if you aren't standing firm today, as you think about it in your own life, then I think something needs to change. So whether you're doing this now and you know you are, or whether you're not at all, this warning is for all of us. And God wants to tell us in this passage in Galatians this, that even though you are decisively set free, and that's what we've seen so far, we need to maintain our freedom by faith as well. So you have been decisively set free. You're free, but you need to maintain your freedom. And that's what we're told to do today. So to help us see why this is so important, I want to use the primary issue in Galatia at this time, in those churches, and help us understand how we can look at this today, what we need to do, how do we stand firm as well. So the churches in Galatia were wrestling with this pressure to be circumcised. We've, we've seen this before, Paul has alluded to this before, but now he, he attacks this one issue here. They're, they're being told that faith in Jesus isn't enough. They, they're being told that Jesus plus nothing isn't enough. It doesn't work. And so Jesus plus something else needs to happen. That's going to work for them. And what these false teachers had come in to persuade them of is that they have to add the Old Testament laws. Now, when you go back to the Old Testament, you know that there are uh, a bunch of different laws. And some are things that happen every day and some, that are, some things happen only once. And so if you think about the dietary laws where they restrict certain foods... You would either obey that or not based on whether you do this at every single meal. So you might make a mistake at lunch and you can obey it at supper. Uh, in chapter 4, it's, it seems like these Galatians had already been convinced to observe the Sabbath and all the rules that come with that and observe these annual festivals and all the rules as well. Because it says in chapter 4 that Paul's astounded. He says, you're observing days and months and seasons and years. And so there are certain things that are easy just to start doing if you're going to believe that the Old Testament laws are going to save you. But there is one thing that, is, that, that dis displays drastically your dedication to the Old Testament, and that is circumcision. And, and this is the issue at hand here. It's easy to adjust your calendar, to adjust your diet, and, and change those things. But if you're going to be circumcised, that is a one-time decision that changes a lot. And the Jews made such a big deal about this. This was the defining mark of whether you were saved or not. Circumcision was such a big issue. And without that surgical procedure, it would be assumed automatically that you were not going to be saved. So this is what was going on here. These non-Jewish Gentiles were getting saved by Jesus plus nothing. 
And then these Jews came in and said, that's not everything you need to do. There's more. Paul didn't tell you everything, and you need to get circumcised. They saw that they would obey some laws, like these, the Sabbath and, and other things like that, but they wouldn't stop at that. They wanted these Gentiles to be circumcised, and that was the issue. And I know I'm saying that a lot, but Paul is addressing this issue a lot here. The Jews were not content with just one thing. They wanted one thing specific. Only then they taught that you could be certain that you would be saved. They, they, they put it all on this one thing. And those Jews were teaching a different gospel. Basically, they said, if you want to be saved, you need to get circumcised. So what's Paul's big problem anyway here? Uh, does he have an issue with circumcision? Is it right or wrong? Is that, is that what the issue is here? No. But is there a deeper issue at stake? Yes. And that deeper issue is that the Jews were telling these Galatians that you need to do this because it's required to save you. When you give something, whether it's circumcision or anything else in our lives, something like that or whatever it might be, if you give it saving power, a requirement for salvation, then you have strayed from faith. And this is why Paul wants to distance himself as far as he can from this issue. Because when you add a work, when you add anything to Jesus, two things happen. One, you say that on his own, Jesus did not do enough to save you. More is needed. And secondly, you say that we are not saved by grace, we are saved by works. And so circumcision, even though it's neither right or wrong in and of itself, when saving power is added to something like that, it's wrong. And Paul wants them to not go through with this. And we see this in his, in his letter. So the issue here is circumcision for them. But what I want us to do, what I want you to do as we go through this passage, is I want you to insert, instead of circumcision, put in something it is that you are tempted to rely on. That you've been thinking in your mind maybe that, yeah, I need to do this, or I'm not going to be saved, or I'm not a good Christian. And that's actually a good question to ask you. What makes you feel like a good Christian? I mean, sometimes it's, you know, I read my Bible, I pray, and one day together at the same time, and I feel like I'm a good Christian today. And we, we, we sometimes add power to that that actually isn't there. These are good things, but they're not what saves you. You, you might also share your faith with a friend or a coworker, and you feel great. It feels good, but sharing your faith is not what saves you. We are told to do this, but it's not what is saving you. You might teach a Sunday school class. You might go to, sun, uh, to, to, to church every single week, and you might feel like, yeah, I am a good Christian, but that's not what saves you. And sometimes we put pressure on other people with these sorts of standards. We do these things, they should do them as well. And sometimes it's not even what we do, it's what we don't do. Sometimes it's, well, I don't swear, or I don't have any speeding tickets. Or I didn't have sex outside of marriage. All of these things, anything, there are a million things that we can say are required for salvation. Anything can be added, saving power too. But whenever we do that, we have some devastating consequences to our faith in Christ. So I want us, as we hear about circumcision, I want you to insert what it is that you might now be thinking about, that you seem to be tempted to trust in, to make a bigger deal about being saved than it really is. Because either you have faith in the grace of God only, or you have faith in your works only. You can't mix these two. And so Paul begins by spelling out the undesirable consequences if we were to add to Jesus. Okay? So verses 2, 3, and 4, I want you to listen for them. The consequences of adding to Jesus. He says, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Did you hear them? Paul's already clearly explained that a person is either saved entirely by works or entirely by grace. You, you can't mix the two. So if you say, I'm going to be saved by grace, then works don't count towards that. And if you say, I'm going to be saved by works, then grace doesn't count towards that. And so we see in verse 2 
This is what's going to happen. If they get circumcised thinking that that's what's going to save them, then Christ doesn't help them whatsoever in being saved. That it loses all value. All the grace that you need is gone if you add to Christ in this way. And if you are doing something today with the expectation that this is what saves me, i got to do this thing and it's going to help save me in the end, then Christ, your faith in Christ is worthless for you. Because you will be measured by your works, not by grace any longer. And verse 3 affirms this because if we want to be saved by obedience, then we need to obey everything that God commands. Not just the things that are easy or the things that we like or the things that we have just given that sort of power to. It's everything. And that's what verse 3 says. Salvation by works demands sinless perfection. We've got to obey the whole thing. James, in the book of James, reminds us that whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point... Has, has become guilty of all of it. So you fail in one place and you're guilty. You, you can't be saved by your works then. And this is why it's a curse to think that you can do this on your own because you'll never be able to perform everything that God demands. Then verse 4 recaps these results. He says, you are severed from Christ. So because of their expectation that circumcision will save you, Paul says, if you cut off some skin, you will be cut off from Christ. He's very blunt here, and he's not going to let this go. Christ will be, he said in verse 2, of no advantage to you. Any addition of works to Christ will remove Christ of all of his uh, uh, grace and his, his advantage for you. If they accept circumcision, he says in verse 4 also, you have fallen away from grace. You are no longer saved by grace. You will be saved by your works. So the consequences of Jesus plus something is, is actually so devastating that all of us need to hear this warning. Need to hear this warning that it is by faith or it is by works. And if we add anything else, it is by works. And we are under a curse again. We need to stand firm. That's the command we're given here. Stand firm. Don't submit again to slavery. Don't go back into working for this. Christians, nothing you do apart from faith in Christ counts for anything in this battle. This is, this is what verse 6 is saying to us. If you look at verse 6, it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. But only, so there's only one thing, faith. Working through love. Those who were, who were already circumcised at this time are not saved because of it. And those who were not circumcised at this point are not unable to be saved. Because both groups of people can be saved not by what they've done and not because of what they haven't done, but only faith. And so we need a picture of this. What does this look like if we are to do basically nothing? Just believe, just trust in Christ. And verse 5 gives that to us. Verse 5 is a picture of what it looks like in comparison to works. It says, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. So we are not working for it, we are waiting for it. We are not doing this work and in our own power. We are allowing the Spirit to do the work for us in His power. Instead of wishing and praying and, and hoping the way the world does, we, we think, okay, in the end, I hope this is enough to save me. And yet, in this way, by faith, we expect that Christ, we have assurance that Christ's work is enough in the end. So to be saved by faith, means to believe, to expect, to bank on, to rely on, to trust in 100% in Jesus. Jesus plus nothing. So brothers and sisters in Christ, you were set free. You were set free from having to earn your own salvation. Hear this and stand firm that you don't go back into doing that. It is a danger, it is a temptation, and we need to stand firm against this. And so the question I have is, are you standing firm in your freedom? Or are you submitting again in some way to that slavery that continues to be used by the devil to call us back into working and working and being under that curse? 
We are set free by faith in Christ alone, and we must remain free by faith in Christ alone. That's the first section we have here. The next part, Paul begins to talk about this, this life, this, this life of faith, which is like a race. And he says in verse 7, you were running well. And perhaps every believer begins well. Because there's, this, there's that moment where you have heard the gospel and you understand what it is that it means. What? Jesus has done all of this work for me and he applies it to me if I just believe? And so we start well. I think we all do. We have this grounding in the gospel, the truth, the grace, and we just love the grace of God. But the longer it takes for Christ to return, the more false gospels we might begin to hear in all sorts of places, whether outside of the church and even sometimes inside the church. We hear all of these things, and it just adds more and more obstacles, to use Paul's analogy here, obstacles as we run this race. Verse 7 says, Who hindered you? from obeying the truth. And Paul's not done talking about circumcision here. The literal Greek question that he asks here is, who cut in on you? Who cut you off? And in this race, we must run by faith. This is how we're saved, and this is how we run. We continue by faith. And so circumcision, or anything else that we add saving power to, is an obstacle for us. If you hear other preachers, people teaching that there's more than Jesus required for salvation, more than faith in Him, that's an obstacle. These are things that we need to stand firm against as individuals, as the church. And we need to do this by doing what 1 Peter chapter 1 says in verse 13. It says, Therefore, thinking of what's ahead and our lives ahead, the suffering that we might go through, the difficulties that we face, he says this is what we need to do. Prepare your minds for action. This is a mental game as much as it is a heart game, a spiritual game, but it's a mental game as well. Prepare your minds for action. Being sober-minded, he says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so setting our hope fully. Remember, this is 100% by faith, by believing, by expecting and being assured that, that Jesus' grace is enough for us. That in the end, it will be enough. We, we set our hope fully on the grace of Jesus. And that's just like what verse 5 called, eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. There's that picture for us. As we run this race, we are looking to the finish line. And there are obstacles along the way that trip us up from faith, that call us away, that draw us from faith, trusting in Christ. And it makes us question. It makes us doubt. Is Jesus, is faith in Jesus enough? Did Jesus do enough? And we all have doubts at times. We all hear other messages that we think about and like, well, what if? And this is how faith works, that we have this assurance in the truth of what God has told us about salvation. And so faith means that although we haven't yet gone and been judged by God officially on Judgment Day, having heard Him say to us, righteous, righteous. We haven't heard that yet, but by faith we trust that that will happen because Jesus' work for us is enough. And then verse 8 tells us that this pressure to be circumcised is not from God because it doesn't line up with what God has said. And it's interesting because it says this persuasion, so they're being persuaded, he says, is not from him who calls you. Now, do you know the voice of the one who calls you? Do you know the kinds of things that he says? Do you know that when you hear something that is not true, that you know it because you know what he would say? And we're faced here now with this question of, do we immerse our minds? Do we fill our minds with the truth of God's word? To know what's right and what's wrong when we're, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're out in the world and we hear these other messages. Can we identify the false from the true? Do you read the Bible looking for those unshakable promises in, the, in the, the effectiveness of Christ's work for you? Do, you? do you read the Bible to strengthen your faith in Christ and therefore continue to stand firm in that? Because when we don't know the words of our, of our Father, when we don't know the Word of God, we won't be able to identify these things. 
When we remove the words of the one who calls us from our, from our lives, if we take that away, we will not be able to stand as strong and as firm as we would if we know them. And perhaps some of us in this room very seldomly read the Bible, and we don't allow it enough time to penetrate our hearts and our minds to really know the Word of God. And I'm not telling you to go read your Bible so that you're saved. What I want to say is read your Bible so that it it bolsters your confidence in Christ who saves you. That's why the Bible was written to point us to Christ and see that we must trust in Him and not any other work. And for those of you who are thinking that, you know, I don't really face this temptation, or when I do, I, I I can handle it. It's pretty easy for me. To do that, I think verse 9 is for all of us, but I think perhaps it's for some of us who are thinking a little too proud of ourselves. It warns against even the smallest of comments, the smallest of conversations, the commercials, whatever it is that we see that has a different message than the gospel. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Because ideas can start. Switching words around in the truth of the Bible changes things. And those small things, if we believe them, if we allow them to to change us, to persuade us, like it's doing here, it can change the whole person. And one person will eventually, or has the potential to change the whole church. And so we need to be careful here. He's warning us not to just say that that's inconsequential. It, It doesn't matter. We don't need to fight against that. No, he says, stand firm against everything. Everything matters. The Bible says to test everything against the truth of itself. And so this is how it is that we can stand firm. And now that we've seen how high the stakes are in this battle and why we need to stand firm, even though Paul's not there in person, he still believes that this will all get worked out properly in the end. And I want you to see where his confidence lies. In verse 10, I have confidence in the Lord that you, that the believers, will take no other view. So for some reason, he's saying God will make sure that the true believers in those churches will remain believers, will not add to Jesus, and will continue to persevere in grace. And he has confidence in the Lord that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So there's another confidence here. Not only will the Christians remain Christians and continue on in faith, And this is all the Lord's doing. This is where he puts his trust. He's not saying, I'm planning, here's my plan. I'm coming to your church. We're going to do this series, and you're going to all turn away from this. No, he says, I believe that the Lord will take care of his people, and the Lord will take care of those persecutors. That God is ultimately in control of all of this. God will take care of his people, and God will take care of of those persecutors. And perhaps not everyone who when the Galatians were reading this letter from Paul. Not everyone in that, in that congregation may have been saved by faith. But God knows who his sheep are. And what comes to mind is in John chapter 10, when Jesus says these words, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one, this is important, no one will snatch them out of my hand. And to add even more uh, cement to that foundation, he says, My Father, who, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So we're in the hand of Christ. We're in the Father's hand. And then he says, I and the Father are one. We know our sheep. No one's coming to take any of these away. And so I think Paul's confidence, and our confidence as well, can be that the Lord is a shepherd and the Lord is a good shepherd. He knows his sheep. He doesn't run away when the thief comes. He knows his sheep and he will take care of them. That every attempt of the devil to cast doubt, to cast questions, to make you really think, is it enough? God will care for you. And be sure that you will take, as Paul says here, no other view. On the other hand, anyone who attempts to lead his sheep astray Jesus says also in Mark chapter 9, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. It would be better for that to happen than for you to fall into the hands of God. And just like Paul, our confidence as believers, as the church, even the church around the world, we know 
that if we have our confidence in the Lord, who is orchestrating all of these things, he will care for his own, and he will judge those who come against his church. This is a truth. And in this also, even though it's true, we cannot lose the salvation that we're given. He says, I give them eternal life, and no one can take them out of my hand. That's assurance. That's why we can say with 100% certainty that by faith in Christ, we will be saved. And yet, it's interesting, why would Paul have to warn them then to stand firm if God's going to make sure they stand firm? Because there is a synergy at work here where God is working in us and we also work as well. And so you do your part, continue in faith, and God will continue to be faithful to you. So hear this warning. Even though you, you can't just sit back and say, well, God will make sure. Well, maybe that's evidence that you were not saved. But in the end, God will take care of us. And, and so we can take heart. And I encourage you that if you've been falling, if you haven't been standing firm, and these other ideas, these other gospels have come in and caused you to turn away, these Galatians are in the process, but he believes that God will bring them back. God won't let them go all the way. And so we can take heart in this. And lastly, I think Paul here needs to defend himself. He's been trying to take care of these Galatians, and now he says that the truth of his message. I think it's, it sounds like the Jews were saying, you know, Paul's in favor of this. He may not have said this when he first came, but now that he's gone, he's actually all in favor of everyone getting circumcised. And this is false. Actually, Paul is fine with circumcision, but he's not fine with it when you add saving power to that thing. When you expect that it's going to save you. And so he wants to get as far away from this as possible. And verse 11 says that if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, so if he agreed with these false teachers... Why am I still being persecuted? Why are they still coming after me? Why are they still trying to kill me if I'm agreeing with them? So it shows that he hasn't changed his message. Because if he did agree with them, verse 11 continues, in that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. There, there's no offense to them. They should like my message. But they don't. Because I still preach grace. I still preach the cross and not anything else. And he's so disturbed by these people that are focused so much on circumcision that he says in verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. In essence, he's saying, if they want to cut off skin, believing that that's going to save them, then why don't they cut it all off? Show how dedicated they are. It's weird to think that that's a biblical verse, like God's word. And yet you hear the frustration and how against Paul is this message of works. It is all by grace and he wants to ground us there. There's no doubt that Paul is standing firm in faith in Christ alone. This letter was written to fight for the truth of the gospel. And he's been telling us this whole way through. But now that these Galatians are understanding this is how we're saved, we need to stay free. We have been set free, he says, stand firm. Don't go back. And as much as we say, why would we do this? There is a danger. There is a lure here that might draw us back. And it is offensive. The cross, when we tell people this, when we look at the cross, we say, that's offensive to me. Because I'm working for my salvation. I'm trying to do everything I can. And I look to the cross and the cross says, you can't do it. You have to just trust someone else. So that's offensive to people when we tell them this. But when we see the curse of works, when we see that we'll never be able to accomplish what is required, and we say, I need help, we cry out, and we look to the cross and we recognize the perfect Lamb of God, the sinless, righteous one who came to die in our place. When we recognize our Savior, we see not an offense but we are overwhelmed with the grace of God. See, the gospel truth is that you and I do not have to work for our salvation, but we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. And so for those of you in this room today who are realizing perhaps for the first time that you have been working as hard as you can, wishing and hoping that some of the things you've done in your life will be enough to save you in the end. To, to you, God wants to tell you he wants to invite you to stop working for it. 
He sent his son to do this work for you, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And now he offers this to you if you would recognize your need for him. And if you rely on him for your entire salvation, what he's done for you, you would be saved. And if that's you this morning, I encourage you to come up to the front afterwards to talk to somebody who'd love to pray with you. And if, and if you are on the other side of this, perhaps in this room you've put your faith in Christ, but you're realizing today that you're not standing firm, that you're really struggling in this doubt and question and all of these things, and you need to be grounded again in this idea of faith an idea of what Christ has done for you. We all, as believers, need to stand firm. Stop working for it. Stand firm in your freedom. And so we need to make it a priority to be immersed in the Word of God, immersed around people, the church, who are people who are going to encourage us and remind us not to go down that road, but fight for us as well. And in this way, we will clarify the gospel for ourselves, we will increase in confidence in God, and we will have a greater capacity to stand firm in our freedom. So may God have mercy and grace for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these reminders in your word. That not only do we hear the truth of the gospel and rejoice in that, but we also need the reminders that we are in a battle. And so often we look around in our world and we don't see this battle face to face because it's an invisible one. It's a matter of, of, of intentions and, and a wrestle against faith. The devil is scheming and the devil is uh, very sly and we need to be careful. And so when these things come, I pray that you would ground us by the truth of your word and, and the encouragement of your people, that we would ground ourselves again and again, deeper and deeper into the truth that we have been set free from working for our salvation. This is the only way that it is good news. And therefore, Father, I ask for your help to help us stand firm. Help us to believe this more and more each day. Sure, there might be doubts. Sure, there might be questions. But over time, Father, would you deepen our commitment, our understanding, and our trust in you and your truth. Help us, Father, as a church to stand firm against all the other gospels, apparent gospels out there. And help us, Father, to, to preach this true message to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.